Welcome home, everybody. You're watching Legacy Television. I'm Jeremy Pearsons, and we are so delighted to have you with us today in the House of Faith. You know, in addition to the Legacy Television broadcast, Sarah and I have had an assignment on our lives from the Lord since we got married to go, to go preach the Word of God. And we've, we've received invitations from people for years now to come and minister in their churches and conferences and meetings around the world. And I'm telling you, we are just as passionate today about that assignment as we've ever been, if not more so. And that's why on the broadcast today, we want to take you into one of those conferences. We wish, we wish you could just, we could just pack you up with us every time we go out and take you with us. But through the platform of Legacy TV, we can take you into these meetings. And early this year, we were invited by Brother Andrew Womack to come to his Gospel Truth Seminar held in Phoenix, Arizona. And we had an amazing time with them, the presence of God was so real, and people were touched and affected by the Word of God. And we're going to take you into one of those services right now. But as we were preparing to, to go into that meeting, the Lord dealt with me. I want you to preach on casting all your care. So that's what we're going to do on this broadcast today. We are showing you part one of casting all your care. Watch this. I know you'll be blessed. Did you bring a Bible with you this morning? You are looking this morning at a man on fire. Something has gone off on the inside of me and Sarah over the last, just the last several weeks. We see where we're headed. We see it with more clarity. We see it with more purpose than we ever have before. And uh, we also see that there's no way to get it done without the anointing of the Lord and without what we see here in the Word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, We'll begin something this morning that I believe, as the Lord leads us, will carry us through the remainder of my time with you tonight, tomorrow morning. But begin in verse 5 with me, 1 Peter 5, verse 5. It says, likewise, you younger people, somebody shout, that's me. If you got to do it by faith, say it, that's me. <laughs> Submit yourselves to the older, turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. He says, yes, all of you, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed, he said, with humility. Be clothed with humility. I grew up in church. I was born in to what I affectionately refer to as the house of faith, like the actual one. I was I'm just convinced that if you do a Greek study of what Paul said in Galatians 6 about doing good to the house of faith, I'm just convinced you'll see Copeland in there somewhere because that was the house I grew up in, man. And it was faith in the morning. It was faith in the noontime and faith when the sun went down. It was, what's the word say, Jeremy? What's the word say, Jeremy? Mommy, I don't feel good. What's the word say, Jeremy? What's the word say? Daddy, I need money. What's the word say? And that's, that's the way it was in my house. And I love that. I wouldn't trade it for anything. But you grow up in an environment like that. You grow up in church. Sometimes I thought about writing a book called My Life on the Front Row. <laughs> the trials and triumphs of a full-time preacher's kid because that's who I was and, and am today. But one thing that's inescapable as a kid growing up in church is church clothes. I don't know how many of you grew up in this kind of environment and you don't see it quite as much anymore today, but when I was a kid, 30 some odd years ago, we had church clothes. And you didn't wear your church clothes anywhere else but church. Why? Because you don't want to mess up your church clothes. And uh, that was a very real thing for me. You had your school clothes, you had your play clothes, but then you also had your church clothes. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of things have changed in the church, I think. A lot of uh, the, the ways people approach church, and you've got contemporary, and you've got modern, and you've got traditional, and a lot of those things are just natural things, and they're carried out in a, a variety of natural ways. And there are, people, there are people that would love to fuss with you over what you should and should wear to church and what grieves the Holy Spirit and what doesn't grieve the Holy Spirit. I heard growing up that chewing gum in church grieved the Holy Spirit, so I was like, well, don't do that. But you know what, when you, you and I start talking about church clothes, what should be more important to us is more important than the clothes we wear to the church should be the clothes we wear because we are the church. 
And when you start talking about that, you have to look at things like this. Be clothed with humility. Humility should be our church clothes. Not what we wear to church. Because the problem with our natural church clothes is what? You can't wait to get them off. You cannot wait, especially as a kid, but even now as a grown-up, if I go minister in a church and it's suit and tie, I don't mind that. I like that, actually. I actually would prefer that. But there's something about Sunday afternoon and shortly before you fall into that semi-comatose state on a Sunday afternoon, you just slide out of those clothes. Why? Well, they're a little uncomfortable, not the most loungy things you can lay around in. Those are your natural church clothes. But let me tell you something. The clothes we wear not to the church, but because we are the church, are never supposed to come off. These are not supposed to be so easily slid in and out of. We are to be clothed with humility. The scripture also tells us to put on the Lord Jesus. Amen. We could spend a lot of time talking about this, but I want you to see what it's saying here. Be clothed with humility. Somebody say church clothes. Now, why would it be so important for us to put on humility? That's the way Paul said it, by the Spirit of God in Colossians, Ephesians. Put off the old man, put on the new one. Why would it be so important that we be clothed or put on humility? Here's why. Because God resists the proud. There's your reason right there for humility. Now, we got a good lesson last night, did we not, in pride and humility. Because God resists the proud. Be clothed with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud. But what happens? He gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Several years ago when I was studying this, getting ready to preach along some of these lines, I'm reading this and I realize that this statement right here, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble, that's a, that's a quote from the book of Proverbs. That's an Old Testament verse. And I thought to myself, you know, just the whole idea, the concept of God resisting anybody, I'll be honest with you, it just didn't sound very gracey to me. It just didn't sound gracious enough to me. I thought, well, that, that seems strange to have that here. Maybe, maybe it's really saying something else that I don't really understand. So I started studying it more, turned back a couple of pages, and you see the exact same quote in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 6. It says, God gives, he gives more grace. Somebody say, more grace. more grace. That's what you need. I don't know if you realized that this morning, but that's really what you need. And it's really what you want, because what is the grace of God? Well, you know it's the favor of God. You know that the book of Hebrews says, come boldly, come how? boldly to the throne folks we got to remember he wrote that to hebrew people you talk about kids growing up in church these are people who heard generation after generation not just their lifetime but for hundreds of years before you don't go in there one guy goes into there into the presence of god these are people who, are, who grew up with a very real sense of the punishment of death because of sin. And there was one guy that went in, and as they say, what would they do? Tie a rope around him? Why, just in case? In case you ain't as clean as you say you are? I'm gonna tie a little rope around you because I'm not going in there to get you. You go in, we'll wait 15 minutes. If we don't hear from you, we are pulling your dead self out, but I'm not going in there. And then all of a sudden, the book of Hebrews the writer trying to communicate what has happened in and through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he says, hey, come boldly to the throne. If I'm somebody hearing him say, come boldly for the first time, I'm thinking to myself, you go boldly. Let's see what happens. But there needs to be an understanding of what's taken place because of what Jesus has accomplished now the throne room is wide open and he said, come on in and don't just come, come boldly. Boldness is the result of confidence. In other words, you know something. The only reason, right or reason you would go into the throne room with boldness is because you are confident knowing what's waiting for you when you get there. If you weren't sure, 
If you thought maybe there was a, a bucket load of judgment and some anger from God and some condemnation waiting on you, you would not dare come boldly. But what we find out is it's a throne of grace. And at that throne of grace, what do we find? Mercy and help. You find help there. So the grace of God is the favor of God. It's the help of God. Paul was begging God to get this thorn out of his flesh one day, and Jesus said to him, hey, 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 my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So the grace of God is his favor. It's his help. It's his strength. It's his presence. How many of you have had a firsthand taste of grace at some point in your life. Amen. If you're born again, you have. Right. Well, here's the good news. You ready? He gives more. I said he gives more. This little taste of the grace that we have had, there's more of it available. And the truth is God gives more of it, but it's right here again in James 4, but he resists the proud of course, gives grace to the humble. So I'm thinking, this just does not sound gracie enough to me. So I started studying it, and guess what? It got worse. I found one translation of that verse that essentially said, God arrays himself in battle against the proud. I think I'll stick with resist. <laughs> God arrays himself in battle against the proud. Go back to 1 Peter, keep reading here. Verse five again, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse six, therefore, or in light of knowing that, what should you do? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So here we see what it's like living on either side of the mighty hand of God. There's a side of that hand that exalts and there's a side of that hand that resists. Which side do you want to live your life on? Wow, I thought there would be a much more resounding response <laughs> than that. Well, I'll just give you my own personal testimony. I would like to be on the exalting side of that hand and not the resisting side. Are we reading scripture here, everybody? Am I reading to you out of the New Testament? Yes, I am. So in light of the fact that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Help me again, who gets the grace? Who gets the favor? Who gets the help? Who gets more strength? Therefore, or in light of that, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. But notice this at the end of verse six. Those of you who are Bible scholars and really love to dig into these things, you'll be interested to know that verse seven comes directly after verse six. Fascinating, I know, right? But at the end of verse six, you notice there's not even a period, it's a comma. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. How? Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. We've talked some about humility, and we've talked some and other times about casting our care onto the Lord, but I don't know that we've been quick enough to see that it's one and the same. He, he, here you've got what to do, which is cast your care. You've got why to do it, because it's because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Now you've got in verse seven, the how to do it. How do you, how, how do you excuse me, how do you humble yourself? by casting your care. Well, let me ask you this then. If casting your care is humility, what is carrying it? It's pride. Carrying your own care is pride. Let's be real plain about it. Worrying is pride. Worrying about your finances is pride. Worrying about your job is pride. Taking the care 
of your family. Well, now, wait a second. (laughs) You're telling me I can't care? Now, hold on. Just wait a second, though. Carrying the care over the health and well-being of your children is not what makes you a good parent. It makes you prideful. We're having fun this morning, aren't we? (laughs) So what I want to do today, and as the Lord helps us, I want to ask a question and answer it. And the question is very simple. Who cares? (laughs) Who cares? Now, hold on. This is something we normally ask each other rhetorically, right? Who cares? And generally, the answer is an understood nobody. (laughs) Definitely not me. But I'm asking you a question this morning, and I believe there is an answer to it, and you need to know what it is. And it's a, you find the answer according to this scripture. Who cares? What's the answer? Jesus does. Jesus does. So let me ask you a series of questions here. Who cares about you? Come on now, really. Who cares about you? Jesus does. Who cares about your health? Jesus. Who cares about your finances? Jesus. Listen to me, who cares about your business? Who cares about your church? Who cares about your ministry? Watch this. Who cares about your kids? Jesus Jesus does. Jesus does. And what makes you a good leader, what makes you a good minister, what makes you a good husband, a good wife, a good parent, is your ability to cast all the care on him. And that's humility. That's humility. Can you see the connection here? If casting your care is humility, then carrying the care is pride. Pride has a motto. You know what pride's motto is? I got this. Pride's got a motto, and it says, I got this. Let me show this to you in Scripture. Go with me to the book of Galatians. a familiar place in scripture. But listen to it again. In the book of Galatians chapter two, listen to what the spirit of God said through Paul. You'll remember this, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I like the King James Version that says, I, I, I live, yet not I. Everybody say those three words, yet not I. Yet not. These three words would come up a time or two in Paul's writings, and you can tell it was almost a struggle to try to get people to understand really what's going on in the life of a born-again believer. You can tell he's having a hard time explaining it. He's like, yes, I'm alive, but I'm not. But I am, but I'm not. I'm alive, but yet I've been crucified. So how can I be alive and crucified? Well, let me explain it to you with these words. Yet not I. It's not me. I'm alive, yet it's not me who's living. It's Christ in me who's living because I was crucified with him. And when I was crucified together with him, I was buried together with him. And when I was buried together with him, I was raised again together with him. And I have been seated together with him. So you you can tell he's trying to explain to people, let me try to get across to you what's going on in me. And we'll look at another scripture in just a moment, but listen to what he says when he goes on here in trying to explain this. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God. If you've got the King James Bible, you can put that up there. It says it very simply like this. I do not frustrate the grace. Pride's got a motto. Pride's motto is, I got this. Do you know how frustrating it is watching somebody else do what you're good at? How frustrating it can be to watch somebody try to do something that you're really good at? 
That's frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, that's very frustrating. Take it from somebody of a younger generation when I watch my parents and grandparents when they were first introduced to a smartphone. <laughs> Take it, I heard it, I heard it. Take it easy. I, I'm not ashamed to tell you, my grandfather threw away the first one he got. <laughs> and now he has since come around. But there, were certain, there are certain things, I mean, I watched my seven-year-old, my four-year-old navigate this thing like they were born knowing how. It's frustrating, isn't it? It's frustrating watching somebody else try to do what you're good at. I mean, imagine if you were a professional whatever, professional builder, right? And you have built everything imaginable. And you have spent your life developing this skill and honing this craft. And you are what I call an actual man. <laughs> Somebody who can take wood, hammer and nail, and do something with it. I admire that. It's an actual man. But imagine you're, you're somebody who possesses this kind of skill, this kind of knowledge, this kind of ability. But your wife's brother gets this idea that he's going to go build a shed in the backyard. Now, he's never built anything not a day in his life. But he says, what do you need? Some wood? I'll go buy some. Bucket of nails? Hey, I'll grab one of those. I got a hammer. And you're standing there looking out the back window of the house, watching him make a mess out of this thing. And you can tell right away, he hasn't laid any kind of foundation, He's not doing anything in any kind of order, much less the right order. There's no rhyme. There's no reason. He's just making a mess of it. And then you as a professional builder, there's only so long you can take this. Am I right? Before finally, you're going to walk outdoor, out, outside, outdoors, and you're going to look at him and say, please, for the love of all that's good and holy, stop. I'm begging you. Stop. And what do you say as a professional, as somebody who loves this guy? What do you say? Stop. Let me do this. Let me help you. Now, pride has a motto. What does pride say? I got this. No, 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 no. I got this. No, no, it's cool, it's cool. I got this, I got this, I got this. And you, as a professional builder, are standing there looking at this thing, thinking to yourself, you don't got this. <laughs> if anything is obvious, you don't got this. There's a mess out here because of what you got. You don't got this. And you're looking at him going, come on, please, just let me help you. You don't even have to pay me. You stopping is payment. <laughs> let me do this for you. And what does pride say? I got this. I got this. But what does humility say? Very simply, help. Do you know the high levels of humility that can be expressed and demonstrated in one word? Help. What are you saying with that one word? I don't got this. And as a matter of fact, the mess I'm in is because I have had it. Lord, help. Who, what are you about to get? If you humble yourself, what is, what is on its way in a hurry? Grace, grace. Grace is your redeemed in response. I say thank you. I believe this is sweet salvation. This is sweet salvation. Grace says you are cleansed in response to say thank you. I forgive. This is sweet salvation. This is sweet salvation. I believe. I believe because you said it. Just because I know you, it is finished, it is done. You have risen, I have won. It is finished, it is done. Now I'm singing hallelujah. It is finished, it is done. Jesus said it, the work is done. It is finished. 
Before we leave the broadcast today, I want to remind you about the Legacy Studios app. This is an amazing way for you and I to stay connected, for you to be feeding on the Word of God that's coming out of Pearson's Ministries International and Legacy Studios. If you don't yet have the app, let me invite you to join us and the 43,000 other people that have downloaded this app. This is a testimony to the goodness of God. Get this app, and now's a good time to get it because we've just updated it. It's got brand new features on it. We want you to have it. It's a great way to keep the Word of God going in your eyes and your ears all the time. You've got to get the Word in your life on a daily basis. That's when it begins to change you and to change things around you. You know, as a partner with this ministry, these are the kinds of things that you're helping us do. We're building a platform. It's not a platform for a person. It's a platform for the preaching of the Word of God. This is our assignment, to serve our generation with God and His Word, to teach them how to live by faith in the day of grace. And the scripture says in the book of Galatians, to let him who is taught the Word share in all good things with him who teaches. If you've heard the Word coming out of this ministry and it's done something for you, it's doing something in you, then we invite you to respond to that by partnering with me and with Sarah and this team that God's put together and get the Word of God out to people all over the world. It's, it's very easy to connect with us through your giving. If you're inside the United States, we invite you to just pull out your phone and text to LTV in any dollar amount to 28950. You can give online at pearsonsministries.com. You can give through the mail, through the, the address that you see there in front of you. If you're living outside the United States, contact us through our website or through the mail. We receive the partnership, Father, and the giving of the people. We call them blessed and increased and multiplied in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching today. We love you so much. We'll see you again next time on Legacy TV. Bye-bye.